In this mini series on Pyro for Beginners, I'm gonna go over the basics on setting up a Pyro simulation. The videos go in chronological order from top to bottom, but can be watched in any order. To start things off, in this video, we'll talk about the smoke emitter. This is very essential to the whole scene. The emitter is the one that kickstarts the entire pyro simulation, and every change you make to the emitter will have a definite impact on the simulation. That's because all the smoke in the simulation comes from this initial emitter geometry. So let's get started with the geometry node. Now it's important that our power pyro simulation has an emitter. The emitter will be the one to kickstart the simulation with an initial body of smoke. This initial body of smoke can either be a fixed volume of smoke that will be finite within the pyro simulation, or we can keep constantly keep pumping more smoke through the emitter that we're going to set up right here. Let me get a bit more topology to work with then throw down a mountain SOP node. This gives us a little bit more uh, interesting shape, a little bit more random shape to it. And in order to get a different shape on every frame, so right now, even though I'm changing the timeline, the shape isn't changing. So I want a different shape on every single frame. The time parameter in the mountain node acts like a seed for the noise. A different seed value will produce a different noise result from the mountain node. I'm going to use a Houdini expression, dollar sign $t, for this parameter. Dollar sign $t, it grabs the current time from the timeline that's currently playing. This will give us a more continual noise fluctuation in the mountain noise, making it look a little more smooth between the frames and motions. It's important that the emitter for our, our pyro is a geometry that has an interesting shape. It also helps a lot if it's constantly changing shape from frame to frame. The shape will help produce more randomness in the pyro simulation. Because the emitter is what kickstarts the entire pyro simulation, the emitter keeps feeding more smoke into the simulation on every frame. The more interesting the shape of the emitter geometry, the higher the chances of getting better results in the simulation. Take your time when it comes to the emitter and try adding different types of noise to the surface of the emitter geometry to get more variety of shapes. Trial and error and happy accidents will make your simulation stand out. So now that we have uh, our emitter geometry, we need to convert it into smoke. But before we do that, we also need to create data that will tell Houdini more about our, our pyro emitter. So this is the general workflow. You start off by scattering points all over the polygons of the emitter. Then we need to create the pyro data and relevant attributes and attach these attributes to our scattered points. These points will then be converted into a volume which will be the initial state of the smoke that will get fed into the pyro simulation. Very similar to flip fluids, which also uses a similar workflow when creating the initial body of water. So let me just... Now, there's a couple ways to convert our polygon into particles. Let's do this the old-fashioned way and add our familiar ISO offset and scatter node pair. This creates particles all over the polygon, and even scatters particles inside in the interior of our polygon. If you only want to scatter points on the surface of the polygon, you can just omit the ISO offset and just drop down a scatter node. Houdini uses the respective source nodes to create data attributes that get attached to these particles. These newly created attributes describe the smoke in more detail and will be used by the simulation to process. So the respective solvers, in our case, will be using the pyro solver. This will rely on the attributes to calculate how other forces will interact with our smoke in the simulation. I also wanted to mention that there is a flip source grains source, crowd source, and what we're using right here, the pyro source. There's also a lot more than that. The list goes on. The workflow is very similar throughout all these source nodes. They all prep the geometry for the respective simulation. Over here, I use the ISO offset and scatter node pair to manually create the particles, which can be transferred to the pyro source node, but the pyro source node can also create the particles for us, so we can actually skip this step. Uh, take our emitter geometry and plug in this into the pyro source directly, which will create the particles for us. So in here, we have in here the pyro source node. We have an option in the mode 
keep input scatter a uh, surface scattering which is what it's doing right now uh volume scatter which is the iso offset what we did here except the pyro source is using a grid like scatter pattern as opposed to the scatter node it was a randomly scattering pattern so there is a disadvantage of using the pyro source like this you don't have as much control as you would using um, creating the particles manually like using the iso offset and scatter pair if i put it back over here you're gonna have to choose for the mode if you do create it, the particles yourself you have to specify under the mode on the pyro source specify keep input so this will keep the points that you've created and you're feeding into it the pyro source node will create the particles for us and also create data attributes and attach them to the particles these are the data attributes that i mentioned before that the pyro solver needs to read in in order to do its computations in the simulation let me select the pyro source and let's go to the geometry spreadsheet here i have a p scale that is automatically created for me but that's it I don't have anything else that's because you have to specify over here in uh, the pyro source node initialize now we have source fuel selected however the, um the funny thing with houdini you have to like click this click something else and then click it back to the source fuel to sort of trigger the update and you, as you can see here in the geometry spreadsheet that we have a lot more attributes created we have a density a fuel p, p scale temperature so all of these attributes will get fed into the pyro simulation. So we still have particles here. We still need to convert these particles into a body, a smoke, that will kickstart the simulation. It will be the initial starting state of the simulation. This sets up the initial state of the simulation. It takes each particle and converts it into a blob of smoke. The size, density, and other data attributes will depend on the attributes assigned to each particles for example p scale describes how big each particle is and this will translate into how large the blob of smoke will be density will tell us how much density to emit from our emitter pyro now up until now we're still dealing with particles we can't just plug this into the simulation directly we need to convert these particles into a volume which will be our emitter volume so if I look over here onto the pyro source, this is still a bunch of uh, points. We do not have a volume yet. So in order to convert these particles into a volume, we need the volume rasterize attribute. This node. Drop this down. What this will do, it, it will convert these particles into a volume so let's take a look what we have here uh, render here so i'm going to pin this on and refresh automatically so there's nothing converted yet that's because um in the volume rasterize attributes for the attributes parameter you have to specify all the attributes that were created in this pyro source sorry let me just move this over the pyro source node created the density the fuel the p scale temperature now we need to plug these attributes into the volume restaurant attribute into this parameter to let it know what are the attributes related to the pyro in order to convert all that data into a volume so what we had here was density fuel temperature there you go so one right after I plug it all in, we start to see a volume. And if you look over here, for this volume rasterize attribute, we have three volumes that are created. The density, fuel, and temperature. Now the P scale refers to the size of the particle. So we're not going to be using that to, uh, to rasterize the volume. I'll explain the p-scale in just a second and how it translates into a volume. Now the voxel size will tell us what is the resolution of our volume. Now be careful with this parameter. If you set this too small, so the smaller the voxel size, 
the more the higher the resolution of our volume so you might be thinking the smaller the better well if it's too small it houdini will crash because you're going to run out of memory and it's going to take forever to compute find a sweet spot for this i usually leave it at the default first and then you can slowly lower this value as your scene matures and as you start to get everything in place during the development process when you're getting the scene ready and setting everything up try to keep it as low as possible for a faster workflow so i want to just go back to the pyro source let me close this okay let me go back to the pyro source for the particle separation in the pyro source you'll need to know about particle separation particle separation just as the name says it's the distance between each particle if you set a lower value for the particle separation you'll be able to populate more particles into the geometry because there's less space in between them same as if you had a higher value for the particle separation then the distance between each particle is further apart thus resulting in less particles that can fit in the geometry if you have a small particle separation value, the more particles. This results in a higher resolution for the volume. With less particles being sourced, the volume that gets converted will start to lose its original intended shape. With more particles being sourced, the volume that gets converted can keep more of its, of its original shape. This is because we have more particles defining the original shape of our emitter geometry. Now you got to be careful with these two parameters. If you create a volume that's too densely packed with that contains a lot of voxels, it'll take a lot of stress on your computer and it'll eat up a lot of RAM. So let's take a look at what we have here. So right now we have 9,236 voxels. Increase the value for the particle scale. Now we have 16,956 voxels. So you need to be careful with these two parameters. If you generate too much volume that gets into the volume emitter, it'll come at a huge cost in RAM because you'll have more voxels to deal with. Your, your volume is a lot larger and a volume costs quite a bit of RAM especially if you plan on using the OpenCL to accelerate the pyro simulation and this in the opencl mainly uses gpu to do its computations you may run out of ram very easily vram is very expensive and most nvidia cards hold around 2 to 12 gigabytes of ram depending on what gpu you have you may be lucky to own a titan and get 11 to 12 gigabytes of ram or more but you'll soon find out even that's not enough to satisfy the pyro solver in s some scenes. If you make the particle scale really, really large, but your initial geometry, like our sphe sphere here, if it started off really, really small, then it might be able to handle the large particle scale here. So it all depends on your scene. A good rule of thumb is to try to keep the particle separation and particle scale at moderate values. Otherwise, it will create too many voxels and result in a flow of errors that will print to your Houdini console when you run out of RAM. Or worse, Houdini might just crash. Trial and error is the best bet to find that sweet spot for your machine. And remember to save often so you don't lose all your changes if Houdini does crash. I can't say what's the best value to put into these parameters because that varies on the type of scene you're trying to make and the type of hardware that you're using. So there is one thing I wanted to mention. If you've noticed, um, the pyro source node has a particle scale here and the volume rasterize attributes node has a particle scale over here. Now this particle scale multiplies the incoming particle scale coming from the pyro source now remember the pyro source here we let me turn on my points comes with a bunch of points and a bunch of attribute data so the p scale that is generated from this pyro source node is attached to the points to each and every point we then feed those points into the volume rasterized attributes node over here it takes it 
and it will get multiplied and each p scale of each particle will get multiplied by the particle scale that we put in here so i can just go like two this would be twice multiplying two to every single particle that is coming in from the pyro source node here you can think of the particle scale from the volume rasterized attribute node as a global multiplier for the particle scale so as a, like a final multiplication that you can do to increase the size of the volume when it's rasterized now if you made it this far you probably can't wait until you get to the next video and finally start setting up the simulation Try to keep in mind the importance of the emitter and remember the more interesting shapes the emitter has, the higher the chances you'll get for a more interesting pyro simulation. Take your time with the emitter and after you finish watching the entire pyro mini series, you can always come back to this first video and to refresh your mind. Check out the next video, Pyro Simulation for Beginners.